Tonight I've decided to speak on Psalm 119. All, that's a joke. All, I was going to say all 176 verses, comment on them, but uh, I won't. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We return to this magnificent passage. We've been studying Ephesians 3 for a while, and we have been discovering what the Apostle Paul refers to as the mystery of of Christ, really the mystery of the church, because it's about the church. It's about the body of Christ, that every member in the body of Christ, specifically in the context of Ephesians 3, Jews and Gentiles, but it certainly applies to the diversity of all believers, regardless of their ethnic background. They are all equally privileged with the same spiritual blessings that God gives to all his people. There are no spiritually poor believers, They're all rich, spiritually rich, and they all have the same spiritual riches. Now, in the process of explaining this mystery, Paul takes the opportunity to tell the Ephesians how he came to be the one who brought them the information, who brought them the gospel, who brought them truths about this mystery. And so, in verses 7 through 9 of this chapter, Paul explains about his own call to the ministry. It's a marvelous passage and often overlooked by people, but his own call to the ministry. And in doing so, Paul refers to and reveals, really, some critical truths concerning the biblical view of the ministry. And I emphasize it is the biblical view of the ministry, not the contemporary view of the ministry. Not only does he speak of the call, his own call to be a minister, But he speaks of the character of the man who is called to minister as well as the content of his message. Now, for the last few times we've met to study Ephesians, we've looked specifically at, number one, the call of the ministry. We've looked at the character of the man who is called. Tonight, we want to look at the content of his message. But let me back up for a moment. Let's talk for a moment just to remind you about the call of a minister. Uh, No man volunteers for the ministry. No man raises his hand in church and says, I'll go. But rather, it is God who calls him. There's an effectual call. There's an inward call. There's an inward desire he has, really a compelling pressure that the Spirit of God puts upon a man that he must minister. He must be a gospel minister. It's affirmed through the people of God who have observed him and say, we've seen his, his gifts, we've seen his abilities, we've seen his character, and they affirm that. Is there some noise coming? Is it from me? I hope it's not from me. They affirm it, and it is a grace gift Paul emphasizes it is a privilege, it is an honor, while at the same time that God calls him into the ministry, the Lord also equips this man. He equips him and he gives him the necessary power to carry on this work. Now Paul says all of this in Ephesians 3 verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Now, that's the call of the man. We've covered that. The character of the man, frankly, it is seen from Paul's own example, his own humility. Look at verse 8, the beginning of verse 8. He says, to me, and he's speaking about this call, this grace was given to him to minister to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given. Now, as I mentioned last time we looked at this verse, this is one of the most remarkable verses in all of the Bible. And it's remarkable because we tend to think of Paul as the greatest Christian who has ever lived. Paul looked at himself so differently. He had a clear understanding of God's holiness, a clear understanding of his own sinfulness. He understood his prior rebellion against the Lord. And Paul sees himself as the least of all Christians. What a remarkable statement. And a man who is unworthy that God would ever call him into the ministry. Now, feeling this way that Paul did, it produced in him a godly humility, a a tremendous sense of his own unworthiness and his deficiencies and his weaknesses, his inadequacies. And that is precisely the kind of character 
that a man of God, one called into the ministry, has to have. He has to have this sense of his own unworthiness to do this great work of preaching the gospel and being a representative of Jesus Christ. There has to be this sense of, who am I that you would call me? And when humility is there, that is the foundation for everything else. All the other godly virtues follow humility. If humility is not there and it's not the foundation, nothing else will be godly in this man's life. He has to reflect Christ. He has to represent Christ. He has to be humble. Now tonight, as we continue looking at Paul's own words about his own ministry, there's a third truth that he tells us about ministers. We've seen his calling We've seen his character. Now, at the end of verse 8 and verse 9, he tells us about the content of the minister's message. Here's what he writes. To me, the very least of all saints, as grace was given, now watch this, to preach, here's his content, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Now, in these two verses, Paul explains his preaching ministry. And the emphasis is on Gentiles. He did this to the Gentiles because, remember, Paul, he's not saying he never preached to Jewish people, but he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul explains the content of his message. That is to say, the substance. What did he actually preach? He says it consists of two subjects. Number one is the unfathomable riches of Christ. The second subject is the administration of the mystery. So first, let's consider what Paul meant by the unfathomable riches of Christ. Well, we have to start with the meaning of the word unfathomable. In fact, if you try to say that fast, it is a difficult word to say. It's also a hard word to translate from the Greek into our English because there is no exact one word in our language that is the precise equivalent. So, Bible translators and commentaries have used various English words and expressions to try to capture the meaning, the essence, the spirit of this Greek word. So, they've used words, for example, like unsearchable, untraceable, inexplorable, inexhaustible, inscrutable. I've also used expressions like unable to be measured without any bottom. My version, I use the New American Standard Bible, it translates it unfathomable. Perhaps the simplest and the best way to understand this word is infinite. Infinite. So, when Paul preached to the Gentiles, what he told them was the infinite, unending, riches of Jesus Christ. In other words, whatever these riches of Jesus Christ are, they have no limit. They are inexhaustible. They can never be diminished. They go on and on and on. And there is also a sense in which no one can fully comprehend them. So, what are the riches of Christ? The unsearchable, unfathomable riches of Christ. They are all the truths about Jesus Christ that are, that are bound up in the gospel message. All the truths about Jesus Christ that are bound up in the gospel message so that when you receive Christ as your Savior, your Lord, you get him. And in getting him, you get all of his riches. What specifically are his riches? Well, I agree with Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones that to try to analyze what Paul is saying here in its fullness, it's really ridiculous because these riches are too vast for us to fully grasp. That's why they're unsearchable. But in essence, the riches that Jesus Christ gives us is everything that we need for a relationship with God and don't have without him. I think there's one verse of scripture that helps to clarify this, and it's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. This is certainly not exhaustive, but I think it gives you some help in clarifying what Paul means by the unsearchable riches of Christ. What he gives us 
in giving us himself. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.30, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Now, that is a great verse stressing the sovereignty of God and salvation. It's by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, meaning this is what Christ became to us, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, let's think about this. What Paul is saying is that Christ not only gives us wisdom, he is our wisdom. He is our wisdom of God. In having Christ in our lives, we have true knowledge, we have true understanding of God, of ourselves in relation to God. We have true understanding of how to live a life that's pleasing to God, how to understand the world that we live in that is not pleasing to God, and on and on it goes. In him, we have wisdom because he is our wisdom. Apart from Christ, we have no wisdom. Paul said in Colossians 2.3, speaking of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, if you have Christ, you have the infinite riches of his wisdom. Apart from Christ, you really have no wisdom in the things that are really important. Secondly, Paul says, Christ also became to us righteousness, in that he is our righteousness. The moment you trusted him as Savior, Jesus Christ clothed you with his righteousness. Now, I, I realize we don't, we don't feel righteous, but that's what God says about us. He clothed you with his righteousness so that his perfect righteousness was imputed to you. On the record book, your record book, it says righteous. Righteous is Christ, fully obedient to the law of God, perfectly righteous. That is what justification means. It means that God declares you righteous based on the work of Christ. And so we have the infinite riches of Christ's righteousness. Apart from him, you have no righteousness. And that righteousness will never end. Third, Paul says that Christ also became to us sanctification. Now, if you have righteousness, why do you need sanctification? Because our righteousness is an imputed righteousness. While our standing before God is righteous, we still live in a fallen world. And we struggle with sin. Our own sin, the world's sins. Uh, Satan's temptations. But Christ is our sanctification. Think about that. In that he helps us every day to live a holy life of obedience to God. Peter said concerning Jesus that in him we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. You don't need to read books outside of the Bible to learn about righteousness or, or life and godliness. You, you don't need to go to a psychiatrist to figure out how to live as a Christian. It's all in Christ. And he's revealed it in his word. So we have the infinite riches of Christ's sanctification. Fourth, Paul says that Christ has also become to us redemption. Meaning that in him, in, in having Christ, we have the, a, a resurrection coming. The resurrection of our bodies that will come in the future. Listen, this is just a taste of the unsearchable riches of Christ. There's so much more. There's his forgiveness, his love, his mercy, supplying us with all things he says to enjoy, his assurance of salvation, his assurance of his love for us, and on and on and on it goes. In having Jesus Christ, folks, you have spiritual wealth that is inexhaustible. And you have these riches for all of eternity. They will never run out. That's why they're unsearchable. That's why they're infinite. Listen closely. Because what this tells us about the content of Paul's message and the content of everyone, every minister who is true to the word of God is that we are to preach Jesus Christ. We are to preach Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done for us, whether we are proclaiming the gospel to lost sinners or explaining God's word to Christians, the content of our message is to be Christ. Now, I don't take it that, that this means that Jesus is found in every verse in the Bible. There are pastors who think that. And I think they happen to impose on the text what's, what's not necessarily there. But it does mean that when you are preaching the word of God, you must relate it to Christ because everything goes back to him. Everything goes back to him. 
Lloyd-Jones has a great word on this aspect of preaching the gospel to the lost. He says, and I quote, What then does Paul preach? What are we to preach? Primarily and essentially the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The riches are the unsearchable riches of Christ. The essence of the gospel is Christ. And what he gives us, not what we do, not what he asks us to do. That comes later. The obvious beginning and essence of the gospel is what he gives us, what we receive from him. I would also add that in preaching Christ to Christians, we are still to proclaim him. We proclaim Christ because what a pastor does in his preaching ministry, yes, it should be. There's an aspect in which it should be evangelistic to some degree because there are always unsaved people listening. But also, the job of a pastor is to explain to his people how rich they are in Christ. That's really what a pastor does. That's precisely what Paul is doing in writing to the Ephesians. In fact, Warren Wiersbe's little book, his commentary on Ephesians, called Be Rich. He had the B series. This is Be Rich. That's what Paul is saying. That's why I take you back a lot to chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are rich. That's what every minister does. That's what he should do. He preaches Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's given us, what he'll do for us in the future. MacArthur, who's not here tonight, explains, <laughs> except in spirit, what a minister preaches. He says this, the unfathomable riches of Christ include all of his truths and all his blessings, all that he is and has. The purpose of every preacher is to declare those riches to tell believers how rich they are in Christ. So, if God has called you into the ministry, and there are men in our church God has called, young men who have talked to me about this, that God has called you into the ministry, then he has called you to proclaim his son. Not yourself, not tidbits, not stories, not illustrations. He has called you to proclaim Christ. And not anything but Christ. Everything you preach will be related to Jesus Christ, one way or another. But in addition to preaching the unfathomable riches of Christ, Paul says there's something else that, that made up the content of his preaching. Notice verse 9. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Now, what is he saying here? Well, what Paul is saying is that part of his preaching ministry, part of his role of being a preacher was to enlighten people. That's what he means, to bring to light, to clarify, to enlighten those who were already Christians as to how God was running or managing his church. He's managing it by the mystery, meaning in terms of how Gentile believers and Jewish believers, people from diverse backgrounds, how they're one in Christ, how they're to get along, how they're to treat one another. In other words, it was Paul's job to preach to believers in Christ about their mutual reconciliation, their mutual membership in the body of Christ. Let me put this to you in a very important principle. One of the most significant truths that a minister is to preach is how believers are to get along with each other, how they're to relate to each other, how they're to treat one another, how they are to love one another, how they are to serve one another. Because why? Because they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're members of his family, members of his body. You look at all of the one another passages in the New Testament, and that's what Paul is talking about. That's what fleshes out this principle. As you read his letters, you'll see how much emphasis the apostle puts on explaining to believers who they are in Christ and how they are to treat one another, esteem one another more highly than yourself, treat one another with uh, love and graciousness and forgive each other. This is how we relate to one another. That's precisely what a minister does. He, he not only preaches Christ to the lost, though he does, explaining how lost and how poor they are without Jesus, but he also preaches Christ to the saved, explaining how rich they are in him and, and how 
God, who Paul says created all things, and I think the implication is he created the church as well. How God wants his church to act, wants his church to behave towards its fellow members. So, to sum up the content of a minister's message, he is to preach the gospel to the lost because he preaches Christ. To the believers, he preaches how rich they are in Christ and the relationship that they are to have towards one another. Now, this doesn't say about how to exposit the word. There are other passages that deal with that. This isn't talking about how you preach. This isn't talking about balancing exhortation and application with explanation. But this is simply talking the content. We preach the word of God. And in preaching the word of God, we proclaim Christ. So if God has called you into the ministry, you have to follow Paul's example of what to preach. You preach the riches of Jesus Christ and how we relate to one another in the body of Christ. You preach the word of God. And those of you who are most of you not called into the ministry, then how does this apply to you? Well, it applies to you. You have to listen to the preaching of the word. You have to let it soak in to you, saturate you with the word. You listen. You learn how wealthy you are in Christ. You learn how to treat other believers in Christ. So you listen, you learn, you obey. And if you're not a Christian, then take heed to the message of how poor and needy you are without Jesus Christ. You're you're a spiritual pauper. You've got nothing. Take him as your savior and you've got everything. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we thank you that you've given us yourself. Not simply riches apart from you. In fact, not riches at all apart from you, but you've given us yourself. Lord, thank you for being our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. Thank you for being that treasure that we love. And thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us because we're in you because of you. And Lord, we would pray that you would help us also to take heed to how we are to relate to one another. Because the church is your church. You created all things. And you created the church. And you've revealed that it's a mystery. That believers of all diverse backgrounds are one in you. So I pray here at Lakeside. Help us Lord. To take these exhortations seriously. To understand that in, in Christ we are to esteem others. More highly than ourselves, that we are to love them, that we are to serve one another, we are to forgive, we are not to hold grudges, we are to be kind and thoughtful. Lord, all those one another passages, help us to put them into practice. And I pray for any here, any listening, who might not know Christ, I pray that you'll open their hearts to the gospel so that they may see how poor they are and how rich they can be in you. This we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. Go watch. You're dismissed.